is fuel for your body, your mind, and definitely your sport. But let's face it, nutrition is confusing and the expectations on girls and women to be thin and have a six pack are exhausting. If you've ever been frustrated with your body, confused about nutrition, obsessed with eating healthy or guilty when you don't, under ate, over ate, or overtrained, and overwhelmed with all the pressure, then this podcast is for you. Nutrition can be easy, you can take control of it, but it might start with letting go of control by asking for help and making a change. I'm Lindsay Elizabeth Cortez, sports dietitian and owner of Rise Up Nutrition, where I empower female athletes to overcome nutrition concerns and perform at their highest level, to stop being confused by all the mixed or harmful messages, and finally have confidence in your body as a fierce, fit, and fueled female athlete. Hey fans, it's Lindsay here. Our guest today, Hannah, is a licensed professional counselor, and we focus the conversation on her work with athletes with eating disorders, anxiety, and OCD. We're going to get to it in one minute. I just want to remind you to head to the show notes and sign up for my email list. I love the content of a podcast to talk and just like audio content really resonates, but sometimes having things in writing, you can refer back to it. Uh, You can search it in old emails on your phone, on your computer. It's just something more tangible. So I really want to encourage you to sign up for our email list, subscribe to my email list. I don't send out too many emails, but it's just enough to know if you're like, oh, I want to get in contact with Lindsay or here's something new that she's offering. And then you have that, right? And you don't have to search through 200 audio episodes to find what you were looking for. So please subscribe to our email list in the show notes. And you can also head to femaleathletenutritionpodcast.com for more information to subscribe to that list, to provide a financial contribution, to search old episodes, or to get in contact. Super excited to know that you as listeners have multiple ways that you can hear from me, get resources from me, and get in contact with me. Okay, let's get to our episode. Hello, fans and listeners. It's Lindsay Elizabeth Cortez, registered sports dietitian and your host of the podcast. I'm here with Hannah DeGroot. She's a licensed professional counselor with a Bachelor of Science in Nutrition from Penn State University and a Master of Education in Counseling Psychology. A lifelong athlete and marathoner, she understands the unique challenges faced by athletes in high-pressure environments. During graduate school, Hannah gained invaluable experience working with the athletic departments of Temple University and the University of Pennsylvania, as well as through a developmental program with the Arizona Diamondbacks. As a recovered individual, Hannah is deeply passionate about helping others navigate their own journeys to recovery. She founded Stride Counseling, a private practice dedicated to helping athletes struggling with eating disorders and obsessive compulsive disorder. Hannah, I also want to say, reached out using our website, femaleathletenutritionpodcast.com to be a guest on this show. So if you have an important mission or message that you want to share, follow Hannah's lead by advocating for yourself and send me a message. Head to the website and complete an application. And here we are, Hannah. Thank you so much for joining on the podcast today. Thanks for having me. I'm I'm honored. Yes, I'm so excited. So if you're like listeners and you're like, I love what Hannah did. I want to share a message too. Just follow in her footsteps. Hannah, I want to hear more about your personal background and just knowing actually that your undergraduate degree or your bachelor's is in nutrition. Yep. And then you got your master's in mental health counseling. So obviously for you, this is like what you do now as a profession, but Was it always the two things that interested you or was it like your journey with nutrition that then led you to want to explore counseling? Can you just kind of describe that progression? Yeah. So I was an athlete my whole life, like you said, and I came from a very athletic family. My dad works in sports. My sister and my brother were both voted most athletic of their high school class, which was always chip on my shoulder. (laughs) But I was a swimmer my whole life. And then when I went to college, I was no longer a competitive athlete. I knew I wanted to study nutrition when I was in high school. And then when I was in, I went to Penn State for undergrad and I was a nutrition major. But my brain is very black and white. I really struggle with living in the gray area and not taking 
everything so literally all the time. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the information that I was learning as a nutrition student was really hard for me to not internalize as rules for myself, Mm. which I now realize in retrospect is really common with a lot of nutrition students and a lot of college students and people in general. But I think at that time in my life, with the loss of my identity as an athlete and the loss of a structure with sports and school and all the things that come with that come with being a high school student to them being in college, having more freedom, less structure, and also learning more things about nutrition led to the development of an eating disorder in myself. Yeah. And eventually I went to therapy and I got help and I think I also just realized that I like nutrition, but it wasn't what I felt very passionate about. I also was minoring in psychology at the time, and I Mm -hmm. loved my psychology classes. I was really interested in them. I had great professors, and I realized I I wanted to do some type of counseling degree. So I applied to Temple. I got in, and I was really loving general counseling at first. And I wanted to provide counseling to uh, university students. And I was lucky enough to have the opportunities, like you said, to do my graduate level internships at Temple and at Penn with their athletic departments. And I fell in love with working with athletes specifically, and working with the my student athletes who had eating disorders. I saw so much of myself in them. And I just really love that population. So I guess to answer your question, the the transition from nutrition to counseling happened really organically. Yeah. I'm, I'm also such a firm believer that someone is looking out for you, like God or the universe or someone has you. And sometimes you just have to go with the plan. Mm-hmm. And I kind of think where I am at this point in my life was just meant to be like, I didn't have to fight it. It just found me in this way. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And that sometimes the the struggles that are, that we face or the obstacles that are put in front of us are potentially there for a reason. Totally. That they shape you. And that's what it definitely sounds like your story. It's like you are doing exactly, you know, what you needed when you were in that struggle yourself. And there's, I think when we go through something like that, there's, there's, we either is like, I want nothing to do with this anymore. (laughs) Like I struggled with food, so I'm healed and I don't ever want to go down that road again. Or wait, I've learned so much from this and I have a a skill and a passion to help other people with it. And that's the route that you went down. And there's no right or wrong for the people who, you know, have overcome something difficult, traumatic, and are just like, okay, done with that part of my life, move on to something totally different. That's, that's great too. But in in your experience, you're able to now use that in a better way. Totally. I was like, oh my gosh, other people need to learn this too. Yeah. I need to share this with everyone. <laughs> well, I think that's also a, a, a testament to like true healing because you mm. can Thanks. talk about it in a positive way now and in a helpful way. Yeah, I, I think that my experiences have been really helpful to share with my clients in bits and pieces. In mm graduate school therapists are taught not to self-disclose or to do so really minimally. Right. But and I, I, for anyone listening, I do do that. Yes. But I think that my experiences really provide value and hope for my clients who are really struggling, who feel like there's no way out or they'll have to quit their sport or sacrifice more than they possibly can in order to recover. And I, I like to provide hope that that doesn't have to be the truth. It's very helpful to know that the professional you're working with really understands and has potentially even walked in your shoes. And I don't think this is a requirement. I'm just saying it's helpful that there's a little bit of understanding and trust already in that relationship. Totally. Uh, It's helpful. And like you said, too, it's providing that hope that, oh, somebody else has walked in my shoes and came out on a better side, maybe I can too. I completely agree with you. Yeah. 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 Well, and I I do the same thing as a dietitian. It's like, okay, no, this is about your nutrition, your health. But let me also share something that happened in my life or when I went through this difficult time and what 
you know, what that meant for me. And we're always going to keep that focus on the client and their needs, but it is story sharing and connection is part of the process. Totally. And I think something that even helps with self-disclosure or is an important like aftermath of self-disclosure is a lot of times therapy skills sound really corny. Like sometimes my clients are like, I'm never going to do that. That just sounds so stupid. And I get it because the names are kind of corny or they just like, they just sound kind of cringy when I'm explaining it out of context. Yeah. But I say to my clients, like when I'm really struggling, I practice radical acceptance or I practice tip, which is a dialectical behavioral therapy skill. And I explain how I'm able to do it in my life. People are like, oh, okay, that's not so bad. I can probably give that a try. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, seeing it kind of in real time, a real example. Totally, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I want to go back to a comment you made earlier about how studying nutrition was not helpful to you. And I think there's two aspects to this. It's, you know, a lot of the career field of dietetics is focused on prevention and treatment of chronic health diseases type 2 diabetes, heart disease, and we're going to put obesity in there as well, and metabolic syndrome. And then if you are somebody who doesn't have those conditions, but we're, you know, we start thinking, how do I prevent it, prevent it? We we can take that information and start applying it to ourselves. But information that's meant for a type 2 diabetic is going to affect uh, somebody without type 2 diabetes very differently than somebody with it, because our bodies are in two different health or disease states. And I think that's where a lot of disordered eating can can happen is we're actually applying information that wasn't necessarily intended for us. I think your story is somewhat similar to mine. And I've heard a lot of nutrition students, not all, this is not an everybody thing, but it's, it's happened a lot because the people interested in studying nutrition are generally speaking all in a state of health but then we're hearing all this nutrition information for a state that's not in good health. Mm-hmm. And we apply it to ourselves. We, we use ourselves as guinea pigs <laughs> and it wasn't meant for us. Yeah. So, okay. I have, I have a lot okay. to say. So like I, like I said, my brain is, I like have to intentionally practice thinking in the gray area. And even though at the time studying nutrition was really hard because I was so black and white, I think at this point in my life, it has given me so many, it's been so helpful because for one, it helps my clients uh, like trust that I know what I'm talking about when I, I say it within my scope of practice, but when I'm able to yeah. talk about nutrition in a more gray area context, it's really helpful. Like for example, a lot of people will say like, I don't eat pizza because it's unhealthy. And I'll be able to say like, well, carbs are good for you. You need that energy. Cheese is a fat. You need fat. Mm -hmm. And tomato sauce is basically pureed vegetables, tomatoes with salt and other things. And that is living in the gray area when we learn to see things in a less black and white way. Yes. And having that information has been so helpful for me to even apply to like chronic health conditions like you're talking about too. Like we can't just look at, for example, someone who has heart disease. We can't only look at nutrition in their diet because there's genetic factors that influence that as well. And stress. Stress is a huge part in sleep. Stress is, I believe, the number one reason for uh, a lot of chronic health or heart disease, Mm -hmm. which is something that a lot of people overlook, especially in our society that really pushes like grit and hard work. Yeah. And with something like obesity, I try to stay away from categorizing people's health by their weight simply because you never know what someone's going through just by looking at them. And I've worked with clients of all body sizes for eating disorders. And unfortunately, People who are in higher weight classes often don't get the care that they need because their doctors tell them that they don't meet the criteria, Mm -hmm. even if they're restricting ungodly amounts of food. Mm -hmm. So all that to say, like, 
nutrition, to even close the loop on what I had said earlier, my like black and white brain that led me to maybe an unhealthy or more challenging path has helped me become the therapist that I am now. And I'm super, super grateful for it. 100%. And I also believe that despite the fact that some things in the academic career field of becoming a nutritionist or dietitian might at first create some disordered eating, the further along you go down, the science dismantles those irrational beliefs about food, the fear about food, and the diet misinformation that exists in our world today. It's like, actually, as you continue to go down the rabbit hole of science, now we're trusting in science, not, you know, Joe Schmo on the internet saying, yes, you know, don't eat this, but eat, eat that instead. Oh my God. I saw the stupidest video yesterday that was like, don't eat sushi because blah, blah, blah. And I was just like, this is all oh, no. people are exposed to such diet misinformation. And I don't know how I got yeah. down that rabbit hole, but um, <laughs> it's like, once you actually get a degree in nutrition, health science, like how the body works, mm-hmm. the science dismantles all the BS so that you can, as your example said, wait, what is pizza? Let's break it down. And this is actually, I'm so glad you brought it up because this is a great tactic that I have also used when I counsel athletes in their nutrition is to take take that food apart, you know, mentally. Mm -hmm. What's actually in it? And this happens a lot. I've found a lot of clients that struggle with eating disorders are specifically nervous about like, I call it combination foods. Like Mm. we don't know what's in it because it's lasagna and it's like all mushed together. It's a casserole. It's a soup. I don't know what's in it. And I'm like, pause, look at it. Tell me what's in it. So lasagna, there's a pasta, there's a red sauce, there's cheese, there's meat, there's a few vegetables and herbs, garlic and onion. Okay. Now let's break that down further with what do each of these individual things do for you? Like you just explained. And I try and teach them like, you know, just find one thing. If you can identify one helpful thing that food is doing for you, the cheese has calcium that's good for my bones. And this is such a great tactic to break that food down and identify what it's, what positive thing it's doing for you. And it, it dismantles that fear and of like, X food is bad for me, or I don't know what's in it. Yep. I even, I was doing that this morning with um, a client who was talking about her, her fear of potato chips. And I was like, okay, well, you are a runner and potato chips are carbs or the chips themselves are carbs and you need electrolytes, which is in the coating of that potato chip. And I was telling her, a lot of people don't know this, but ultra marathoners eat potato chips mid ultra marathon because they are like the perfect food for a for a, a long race like that. Yes. Yes. Yeah, it helps to just break it down and and I I agree with you. Just find one thing. There's usually more than one thing, but if you can just af- identify one thing of as to how this is helping you. And that, you know, to get away from that black and white thinking of this food is good, this food is bad. If there's one good thing, then you can't ever say that the entire food is bad because there's at least one good thing about it. Yep. No such thing as bad foods. Yeah. And I know that's so hard for people to accept, but I I always go to the, I go to the extreme in order to just prove that it's not bad. Like, and I'll use my son. I use my son now as an example of this, just because he's got a rare metabolic disease and it's rare. But because of that, like, the things that keep him healthy <laughs> are things that most people would think would not be healthy for a baby. So he is on a completely bioengineered soy based formula, right? So, like, nice. there's other people in the world who are like, oh, bioengineered ingredients and formula. I'm like, that's the only thing that keeps him alive. <laughs> So that's healthy for him. And then I also, uh, he suffers from extreme and severe hypoglycemia. So we just give him straight Mm -hmm. glucose gel, but just like an athlete would in a run, Um, straight glucose gel. He's a baby. I give him straight sugar. All the dentists out there, like no sugar for babies. I put that sugar right on his pacifier and he sucks on it. (laughs) Those things keep him alive, right? So it's like, 
we can't just say sugar is bad. We can't say soy is bad. Mm -hmm. There are people, there are situations, there are circumstances where it is providing a benefit. And I always use extreme. Sorry, my my son is on my mind at all times. But like you mentioned, ultra marathoners, it's like, oh, potato chips help them. I'll net potato chips, Oreos and flat Coke. Flat Coke. I was going to share that one as well. Yeah. You know, in a world where we're like soda is bad, actually, (laughs) it could be great for distance running. If it's flattened, once again, I'm going to say it could save, you know, type one's a type one diabetic's life in a situation like that. So Mm -hmm. if you can find one good thing about a food, then you know that there could be a role for it. So we can't just flat out say this is bad. Totally. I completely agree. Thanks for letting me go on that tangent. That was fun. (laughs) That was good. You did a good job on that. I like that. Just love to share that message that I know you are sharing with your clients and things like that. So let's get more into the work that you do because you're already like alluding to it. But um, so there's, you work with athletes with eating disorders. You also work with OCD and anxiety. Yep. Now these are three separate things, OCD anxiety, eating disorders, and yet there might also be a lot of overlap. Could you touch on, you know, where that overlap is, like chicken versus the egg, does one cause the other? Mm-hmm. Are these things that we are born with that develop? Or, you know, can you just kind of elaborate with your experience in the three of these things individually and together? Totally. So eating disorders and OCD both fall under the anxiety umbrella. Mm. They are coping strategies, essentially, for anxiety or stress or trauma. So I would say the anxiety typically comes first. And the way that a person copes with it is through an eating disorder or OCD or both. Mm. Eating disorders and OCD share a lot of common traits. They are both driven by or often driven by perfection. They tend to people who are more rigid or strict in their behaviors or diets or schedules tend to engage more frequently. I have some statistics about 84% of college athletes engage in disordered eating patterns or weight control behaviors at some point, which is staggering. Yeah. And about 35% of athletes have OCD. So all that to say Anxiety probably comes first, but the way that a person copes with it is through an eating disorder, disordered eating, OCD, or some other type of maladaptive coping behavior. Yeah. Yes. Shockingly high statistics. And because of my work in this space, I completely believe it. And I think, too, one thing you mentioned with that 84% engage in eating disorder weight control so many people think that weight control is like, maybe it's own thing. Maybe it's even healthy (laughs) or maybe it's not. Maybe it's, as you mentioned, maybe it's because we're, we have this anxiety about being judged by how we look or making the team if we're not up to standards that we believe we should be at. And so we're trying to manipulate or control our weight. Mm -hmm. Even if it's not a diagnosable eating disorder, it's still a behavior Mm-hmm. engaging with food that might even be the result of something else. Like you mentioned, the anxiety kind of ahead of it. You're overarching. Yeah. And so much of what you just said reminded me about how much pressure athletes face on a regular basis between pressures to perform well in their sport and in school and present themselves as this person who has it all and can do it all and do it all very well, because that's typically what they're used to. And that pressure is often another variable that impacts the likelihood of developing anxiety or an eating disorder and or OCD. And that doesn't mean that someone definitely will develop mm-hmm. an eating disorder or something. It just means that their likelihood is maybe a little higher. And as you were saying, you were talking about like weight control behaviors and all these things. And my rule of thumb when it comes to someone wanting to seek therapy or seek help for their behaviors. I I don't believe in telling someone that they're they can or can't do someone do something with their body. Mm-hmm. So if someone came to me and they said, you know, I'm having this relationship with food that makes me uncomfortable, but I really want to go on a diet and all the things. 
if, if that person ultimately decides they need to go on a diet, it is not my place to tell them what they can or can't do. My goal is to help them understand a deeper relationship or a, a deeper understanding of their relationship with food so that they can make informed decisions mm-hmm. that are best for them. Mm-hmm. Body autonomy is very important to me and integral to my practice. So I, I really think it's important to help people understand their goals and make their decisions yeah. based on what's best for them. Yes, that was really well said. Thank you. Because I never want people to think that like want like that desire to change their body or change their nutrition is inherently a bad thing. It's not inherently a bad thing. It's all about like your yeah, the intent behind it and is if this making your personal choice if it's really the right thing for you or not. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot that goes into that. So I think guiding them in making an empowered decision that is healthy for their body and healthy on a variety of levels, not just physical health, social health, mental health, all the health. That's the key thing here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And finding a way for them to pursue those goals in a way that's sustainable and doesn't sacrifice other things in their life. Mm -hmm. Like if someone is really stuck on wanting to go on a diet, for example, or lose weight or, or whatever it is, I my goal is to help them figure out how to not sacrifice their mental health in order to mm-hmm. do so. Continue, you know, having meals with friends, having foods that you like and being able to enjoy the most important things to you because that's that's what life's about. It's not about ultimately your headstone isn't going to say was really good at losing weight. So, mhm. Mhm. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, people don't remember you for those aspects. Mm-hmm. They shouldn't. <laughs> and if they do, they're weird. <laughs> or they just need to see me. <laughs> Absolutely. So what I think kind of what I'm hearing from you too is just that relationship between anxiety then leading to eating disorders and OCD. And a huge part of your work is you know being a, a therapist, a counselor, to address that, it, what are, I, this is a big question. I'm sorry. I'm not setting you up here, but like, I'm nervous. <laughs> what are some ways that we can support athletes specifically in reducing anxiety in order to reduce the likelihood or probability of dealing, of, of developing these coping mechanisms? Like maybe the question is like, what are better coping mechanisms when we have anxiety? How do we better deal with anxiety? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. And definitely really complicated because like so much of the the pressure that pressure is such a fine line, like the pressure that athletes face to perform well is part of what helps them perform well. Mm-hmm. So if we completely take that pressure away, who knows mm-hmm. how their performance will change. I believe that the most important factors to supporting athletes or for supporting athletes rather, are prioritizing the human over the athlete. Yeah, And that comes back to coaches taking a person-centered, positive coaching style, Mm -hmm. supporting athletes rather than throwing them under the bus. And I have a good example of that. My fiance played rugby when he was in college. And he told me that his coach used to always tell him, when your teammate makes a mistake, you do not berate him. You do not yell at him. You tell him, like, you'll get it next time. Because that athlete is already in their head and they don't need their teammates not having their back on this. Yeah. So all that to say that coach's approach with support your teammates and I'll support you is is good. Prioritizing an athlete's health over their performance is really important. I know you talk about this all the time on the pod, but so many athletes I see have symptoms of reds. Mm -hmm. So they are pushed so far that they are under fueled and then they have injuries. Mm -hmm. And coaches are, in my opinion, responsible for being sure that their athletes are taking care of themselves and not just pushing them to get the best performance outcome that they can. Mm -hmm. It's also really helpful to have coaches who support athletes of all body sizes and do not enforce weight loss. Mm -hmm. I've heard horror stories of of athletes publicly weighing their athletes, announcing their weight to the entire team, 
shaming them, like making them feel horrible for their bodies. And that's not helpful. Like it's simply not helpful. And people of all body sizes are capable of accomplishing incredible things. So we want, we want coaches and parents and teammates who can celebrate bodies of all sizes. Yeah, it, it's also really helpful to just have teammates and friends who are supportive and love you and care about you for the person that you are rather than just how good you are at your sport or how smart you are or any of those important but less important factors. Amazing tips. And as you were talking, you really reminded me of an episode I had, I think back in the spring with head women's lacrosse coach, Lindsay LeMay up in Michigan. I'm going to have to fact check that. But (laughs) (laughs) she, as a head coach, made in her first few years it a priority to focus more on the well-being of her athletes as humans over performance. Mm -hmm. And within two years, they were having better performances as a team than in history (laughs) of their team. Yeah, I was going to say, didn't they like win everything? Yes. I, I remember that episode. Yes. And I think it to your point of like really addressing the human, the person over the athlete, we can get so caught up in the thrill of winning and competition and being an athlete and all that. But it's like in order to be the best athlete or have the best team performances, treating the human being first and foremost. And so if you're taking Mm -hmm. care, if you're putting all that pressure on the athletic performance outcomes, then you might not be treating the athlete as a human and their feelings and their emotions and their anxieties. And if we're taking care of that first, then we're going to actually see the best performance outcomes. So there are studies on this too. I wish I could cite one off the top of my head, but there are studies that show when you respect and love your teammate and coach, you want to perform well for them. Yeah. Versus when you are like, when you don't like them or you don't care or you're indifferent, you're not willing all the time to give your best because you don't care that much about who you're playing for or who you're playing with. Oh my gosh. Sorry, but we can just apply this to like work situations too, (laughs) right? But like if you have a boss that you don't respect, like you're not going to put in as much effort in your work and you're not going to have good work outcomes. And then if that boss is then like asking you to do overtime, like no, Mm -hmm. (laughs) it's a mental health goes down, like sorry to go there, but suicide, you know, goes up. It's like, you need to no go there. Yeah. Let's go there. Right. Because this is a huge issue with that pressure and stress and like valuing the person, the individual, if you as a coach or as a boss, like care for that person, they're going to care about the work that they put in for you too. Yep. Period. Period. (laughs) So, and this is what's so great about sport is the Lessons we learn in sport translate to all of life. (laughs) Yes. That's actually one of my favorite things about working with athletes. I feel like there are so many lessons that are applied to eating disorder or no CD recovery that are applied to life in general. I also just love like athletes are so gritty and hardworking and so dedicated to their goals. I feel inspired every day working with people like that. And it's so cool to see them apply that grit and hard work to overcoming eating disorders and OCD. Yeah. I've been doing research for my book that I'm in the process of writing that I'm talking about, even though I'm in the beginning oh, yeah. stages, super beginning. I'm writing the book proposal you. to land a publisher. So I don't even have a publisher yet. But anyways, I'm... Well, congratulations. Thank you. It's on my mind every day. And so anyways, I just yesterday, you know, was trying to find... I knew, I knew this was in my head, but I had to actually find the statistic to confirm it. And it's like 90% of women in C-suite positions. So CEO, CFO, 90% of women in those positions played competitive sport in high school or college. Mm -hmm. Wow. I did not know the statistic was that high, but I totally believe it. Yeah. And it's just, again, it's those life lessons of like everything, overcoming adversity, goal setting, handling pressure, working as a team, like working towards a, a bigger mission, <laughs> bigger, bigger goal, all of that. And anyways, just the life lessons of sport translating over into work and therefore life are so powerful. And which also I think is going to circle back to the importance of helping athletes deal with eating disorders and OCD and anxiety to help them stay in sport 
longer if it's the right thing for them. At some point in time, it's it might not be, and that might be part of the healing recovery process. But if we can mm-hmm. help people deal with their anxiety, deal with the OCD, find a, a better way to cope, not have an eating disorder, then we might be able to stay in sport longer or return to sport at a later date in our lives to just like, if this is, if you love sport, like there's a part of you as a person that like, you know, wants to do that. And so we just need to find a way to deal with these things that are hindering our mental health, potentially physical as well, so that we can get back to doing what we love. Totally. I completely agree. And just on that note too, is that something that you sometimes guide people in, in your counseling is their relationship with sport and are we, is this really a good time to be in it or not? A hundred percent. That comes up at different points in the therapeutic relationship with almost all of my clients. And ultimately, it's it's always their decision. Everyone's relationship with their sport and food in their body is their own. So again, I would never dictate what someone should or shouldn't do with their future and with their sport. Yeah. Eating disorders are complicated because sometimes we do approach an area where it's medically really risky or potentially life-threatening to continue exercising yeah. on such a with such a severe right. eating disorder, I guess you would say. And in that case, I typically have my clients work closely with a dietitian yeah. and a medical doctor so we can be monitoring their health at all times. My goal is always to help a client stay in sport if that's what they want for as long as they can, as long as they are medically able to and it's not hindering their behaviors or encouraging their behaviors because I know so many of my clients really rely on their sports for their mental health but sometimes it's inescapable we, we can't continue making progress if a client is continuing to engage or play the sport but it's on a client by client basis mm-hmm. I have had clients who decided that they don't want to play their sport anymore and that's okay and I've also had clients who stayed in their sport and continued to recover. And that's been fine too. There's never a one size fits all approach. It, it always comes down to each individual person and, and what's best for them, which I know like listeners who might, this episode might be resonating with them so far might hear that and be like, Oh, that's so annoying. There's, I know but it's the truth. No, it's the yeah, truth. So it's- and it also comes down to like we were saying before being in the gray area, like mm-hmm. what's right for one person isn't right for the next person all the time. Everyone's individual lifestyles and genetics and factors have to be considered with each person's approach to recovery. Yes, I agree completely. And it's just that reminder too, that an eating disorder actually is a mental health disorder, but it has physical implications. And so it's, you know, where is that line as to when the physical implications are now really dangerous because sport and exercise is a physical thing that you're asking your body to engage in. And that's where a line might have to be drawn, but it's not clear cut. Yeah. Anorexia is actually the second leading killer of all mental health conditions only behind opioid use. So it's it's very serious yeah. and something I have to keep in mind when working with athletes for sure. Yeah. yeah. Because I think the other issue even as a practitioner in this field like the body is so amazing and so an athlete even with something with severe you know anorexia sometimes the body is still like showing up like amazingly yeah yeah Yeah, it's amazing and it can trick you into thinking you're okay or they're okay because it's like but I got through that workout just fine but I just had a PR yeah that is something I hear all the time I'm not sick enough or I don't think I I don't think I need this because I'm not I'm not that bad. And my rule of thumb is if you have any challenges in your relationship with food or your relationship with your body, you deserve help. It doesn't matter quote unquote how bad they are. If you have even an inkling of discomfort, you deserve help and that's okay. Absolutely. I think instead of trying to identify what is sick enough, instead envisioning where do I really want to be? What are my, what's my vision of optimal? Where's the, where do I see myself in one year or five years? Like what's the best version that I want to be? Mm-hmm. And if you're not there right now, 
then that's deserving of help. That's, de- you know, it's, and I think sometimes in, instead of figuring out at what point are things so bad that I need help, instead it's, where do I want to be in, and identifying where the gap is? Okay, I'll go get help for that gap. Yeah. And I'm going to give a quick shout out to Dr. Gaudiani's book, Sick Enough. She is a medical doctor specializing in eating disorders based in Colorado. And I haven't had her on the podcast yet, but I think that book has been really helpful for people battling with that question. Yeah. Of, I mean, the title says it all. Am I sick enough? So that, that book might be helpful for people. So I wanted to also just ask you, OCD, I want to dive into OCD specifically. Sure. Of like, what are some signs and symptoms of OCD that somebody might identify? I should get help with this because I also, this is my ex- personal experience is I also feel like that word, that term OCD is kind of thrown around a lot. Sometimes, yeah. sometimes even in a joking way, like, oh my gosh, I spent an hour cleaning up the kitchen because I'm OCD. And it's like, I'm so OCD. Yeah. Or like, or you just needed to clean your kitchen. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. so in our culture, and again, I don't know if this is just my world, but I just feel that in our culture, the term OCD is thrown around loosely when it actually is a mental health disorder and yeah. something that isn't just for somebody who cleans the kitchen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So some common signs of OCD are like rigidity or feeling really stuck in behaviors and when a person isn't able to accomplish those behaviors or practice those rituals, really high levels of stress. So for an outsider who doesn't really have any mental health knowledge, that might look like someone like chronically showing up to practice late because they might be like practicing rituals and unable to leave their dorm or leaving their house before those rituals are complete. That also looks like, I don't know, practicing the same pre-race routine every single time and then feeling really, really high amounts of stress when that routine is not accomplished in a very particular way. Mm -hmm. This applies to eating disorders too, but ultimately like a loss in sport or a loss in joy in sport, feeling like you don't really care about the things that previously brought you joy, that indicates a mental health challenge in general but it's very common with OCD and eating disorders. So all that to say with OCD, we're ultimately looking for a behavior, which is the obsession, followed by a a ritual or some type of practice around the obsession. Oh no, hold on. I'm repeating this wrong. I'm sorry. We're ultimately looking for an obsession, which is like a fixation on something. And then a behavior or a ritual that we apply to the obsession, that is the compulsion. Mm -hmm. So as I said, that can look like practicing certain behaviors or just feeling fixated. And ultimately, it depends on if that is causing that person significant distress. That's when we need intervention. Yeah. And I think another interesting thing with OCD and athletes is like that compulsive behavior is sometimes even exercise. Yes. Super st- athletes are so superstitious. And I had um I had a client once came to me with the eating disorder and as we're healing the eating disorder, OCD picked up with certain like movements, physical movements mm-hmm. and exercise mm-hmm. and I did have to refer her out for that help because as much as I was helping her with the obsession over body image was ultimately the obsession was obsession over body image, then creating the eating disorder and compulsive behaviors around movement as well. And so I was dealing with the eating disorder, but I did have to refer out for the OCD regarding the movement behaviors Mm -hmm. to help with that. I, it's like that it got a little outside of my scope. Totally. And I do want to share that she did heal from both on my end. She's one of my biggest success stories. And I'm just Hey, I'm so proud of this. Good for her. Good for you. Yeah. Well, I say my story. It's not my story. It's her success story. I'm just so proud. You were part of it. I'm so proud of her. And um, <laughs> and that uh, like OCD side too, I'm curious to hear from you because th- regarding my client and her like movement thing that healed, but I'm also curious is like, is OCD itself, is that something that you can like totally recover from? Or is it something that you kind of like live with lifelong and you manage? Good question. So 
OCD is a chronic disorder. And similar to eating disorders, they're by, they have genetic components and social components as well. So with OCD, it's, it, we like to call it a sticky brain. Your brain likes to tackle things that you care about and latch onto them. And it's really common for someone who, as you were saying, like had an eating disorder, they start maybe making progress. Their eating disorder, so their OCD tackles and latches onto something else. Yeah. So when I say it's chronic, I do not want to scare anyone because you can 100% recover. Mm -hmm. That just means you become aware of what your activators are and you become aware of the signs that your body exhibits Mm -hmm. and that your brain exhibits when you're feeling especially susceptible Mm -hmm. to having like a bigger bout of OCD and you just use the skills that you've learned, you figure out what works for you and you know when to intervene. Absolutely. Yes, that makes a lot of sense. It, it, it sounds scarier than it is. Every, everyone's journey is their own and everyone's level of recovery is their own too. So everyone recovers at different speeds and everyone is in charge of dictating when they've recovered enough. Right. Right. To, like you can say that I, That's good. <laughs> I'm good. I'm recovered. You can get to that point. Absolutely. But it's almost your own definition of what yep. recovered from OCD actually is or recovered from an eating disorder actually is. Totally. And, and it's not my job to say you're, you're recovered, you're good, or no, you can't stop there. You haven't done enough. Yeah. Because it's their lived experience as to am am I at my goal of optimal wellness, health, and happiness? Mm-hmm. Yep, a hundred percent. Did I say wealth, wellness? No, wellness, health, and happiness. Okay, <laughs> wellness and health. In my head, it spelled out wealth, and I was like, I hope I did not just say that. I thought that was good. I liked it. <laughs> well, Hannah, what an insightful conversation. Thank you so much for sharing. And you clearly displayed the value that you're providing to your clients. If somebody is interested in your services, are you licensed only in the state of Pennsylvania? And can you share a little bit about how somebody could reach out to you or get help? Totally. So I am licensed in Pennsylvania and New Jersey at this time. I am looking to get licensed in a few other states. So if anyone has any ideas, feel free to shoot me a message. I am also happy to chat with anyone who is looking for resources and connect people to resources in their state. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to reach out to me. And you can connect with me on Instagram at stride underscore counseling. If, if the stride counseling Instagram user is listening, please sell me your handle. I've been messaging you. <laughs> and you also can find me, find my website at stridecounseling.co, not com, co. C-O. I know. So many yes. handles and websites and it's hard to match it up with your brand these days. I know it gets frustrating. I've it's such a pain. I've been in the same boat. I had the, I'll share right now. That's why I don't have the domain femaleathletenutrition.com has to be female athlete nutrition podcast.com because the other one was taken and I tried reaching out to them because it's not even anything relevant really. And, but I couldn't get it. And I'm just like, ah, just got to move forward with this instead of starting a whole legal battle that. Yeah. Yeah. I did the same thing. It scratches my brain, but (laughs) I'm accepting it. (laughs) And I have to, I know you've got to get going, but I have to ask our fun rapid fire questions. Yeah. If there's one food you could eat every single day for the rest of your life and never get sick of it, what would it be? Ice cream. Love it. And I do eat it like every single day and I never get sick of it. Amazing. You're already doing it. Already. Yeah. Already on track. (laughs) What is your favorite sport to participate in? Oh, um, to participate in. I want to say running, but I would probably say like kickball or something fun. Yeah. But you do running more often. Yeah. I run like every day or an appropriate amount of days, but it's not as fun as like playing kickball or volleyball with my friends. I love that. Yeah. And how about as a fan and a spectator? What's your favorite sport to watch? I love watching football. That's great. I went to Penn State. Come on. I know. Big team there. We are. And last question, if there's a female athlete out there to give a shout out to for being a role model for any reason, who would that be and why? Uh, this list is really long. I, I, I guess I'll just go with the first one that comes to mind, though. 
I'm going to give a shout out to Simone Biles, my girl. Mm-hmm. She, when she spoke so wonderfully and beautifully about her mental health journey at the Olymp- Olympics, it actually was what pushed me to start my own private practice at this time. Wow. So if, if she wasn't so vocal about her mental health journey, Stride might not exist yet. Yeah, that, that was really huge for her. Uh, not for her, for everybody, but like for her to do that. She's so brave. And explain. And then to also, that was in 2020 or 2021, technically. And then for her to come back and be so successful in the 2024 Olympics. Yes. Yeah. She's defying so many odds here as a female athlete and in her sport. But it's just like that proof that like, take care of yourself as a human being first. She said that she met with her therapist the morning of her her big event. Yeah. Which was like, uh, yeah, she's the best. I love her. Yep. Amazing. Thanks. Well, thank you so much, Hannah. This was a wonderful conversation. We'll include links to reach out to you and head to your website in the show notes. Thanks, Lindsay. Have a good rest of your day. Well, everybody, thanks for listening. I really hope you enjoyed that episode. And if you did, if you are a true fan of female athlete nutrition, then I would love if you could support our podcast by spreading the word. Share a review on your listening channel. Give us five stars. It really helps get the word out and get the show more views to positively impact others. Also, you can support the podcast by joining our Patreon. Head to patreon.com slash female athlete nutrition to consider a donation or even better, join our membership where you get extra monthly content and perks. We don't want you to simply listen alone. We want you to be a part of a community and a movement of fierce, fit, and fueled female athletes. So patreon.com slash female athlete nutrition is where you can do exactly that, learn more, and join. A huge thanks to our affiliates and partners as well. Once again, Prevenix, Inside Tracker, or Gain, Practice Better, Jen and Carrie, please go check them out and their links in the show notes where you can get deals and discounts. Last, be sure that you do more than just listen. If you need help with fueling, it's time to take action. Head to my website to learn more. You can either book a free call with me to learn more about our coaching programs and how we can work directly with you, whether it's the fast track or otherwise. Or you can take our online self-studied course, Female Athlete Nutrition. You can literally sign up and gain access right now. You can explore our downloadable products, including the Red S Recovery Guide, High Iron Fueling Guide, or if you are a coach of a team, check out our brand new coaches toolkit for teams. You can also just learn more. We have a blog, a Red S quiz to see if Red S is affecting you. If you need help, I want you to get help fast. Too many girls and athletes struggle with nutrition, but you don't have to any longer. You can rise up with the power of nutrition, take action today in any of these avenues, and become fierce, fit, and fueled. Links in the show notes, and we'll see you next time.